The Awakening, The Resurrection, Leo Tolstoy, Part 6. Chapter 44. At the usual hour, the jailer's whistles were heard in the corridors of the prison. With a rattling of irons, the doors of the corridors and cells opened, and the patter of bare feet and the clatter of prison shoes resounded through the corridors. The men and women prisoners washed and dressed, and after going through the morning inspection, proceeded to brew their tea. During the tea-drinking animated conversations were going on among the prisoners in the cells and corridors. Two prisoners were to be flogged that day. One of these was a fairly intelligent young clerk who, in a fit of jealousy, had killed his mistress. He was loved by his fellow prisoners for his cheerfulness, liberality and firmness in dealing with the authorities. He knew the laws and demanded compliance with them. Three weeks ago the warden struck one of the chambermen for spilling some soup on his new uniform. The clerk, Vasiliev, took the chamberman's part, saying that there was no law permitting an official to beat prisoners. I will show you the law, said the warden, reviling Vasiliev. The latter answered in kind. The warden was about to strike him, but Vasiliev caught hold of his hands and held him fast for about three minutes and then pushed him out of the door. The warden complained and the inspector ordered Vasiliev placed in solitary confinement. These cells for solitary confinement were dark closets iron bolted from the outside. In these cold, damp cells, devoid of bed, table or chair, the prisoners were obliged to sit or lie on the dirty floor. The rats, of which there was a large number, crawled all over them and were so bold that they devoured the prisoners' bread and often attacked the prisoners themselves when they remained motionless. Vasiliev resisted and with the aid of two other prisoners tore himself loose from the jailers, but they were finally overcome and all three were thrust into cells. It was reported to the governor that something like a mutiny occurred, and in answer came a document ordering that the two chief culprits, Vasiliev and the tramp, don't remember, an application given to some tramps and jailbirds who, to conceal the identity with characteristic ingenuity and stupidity, make that answer to all questions relating to their names, be given thirty lashes each. The flogging was to take place in the women's reception room. This was known to all the inmates of the prison since the previous evening, and everyone was talking of the coming flogging. Korableva, Miss Dandy, Theodosia and Maslova flushed and animated, for they had already partaken of vodka which Maslova now had in abundance, were sitting in their corner talking of the same thing. Why, he has not misbehaved! Korableva said of Vasiliev, biting off a piece of sugar with her strong teeth. He only sided with a comrade. Fighting, you know, is not allowed nowadays. They say he is a fine fellow, added Theodosia, who was sitting on a log on which stood a teapot. If you were to tell him, Mikhailovna, the watchwoman said to Maslova, meaning Nekludov, I will, he will do anything for me, Maslova answered, smiling and shaking her head. It will be too late. They're going to fetch him now, said Theodosia. It is awful, she added, sighing. I have seen once a peasant flogged in the town hall. My father-in-law had sent me to the mayor of the borough, and when I came there I was surprised to see him. The watchwoman began a long story. Her story was interrupted by voices and steps on the upper corridor. The women became silent, listening. They are bringing him, the fiends said Miss Dandy. Won't he get it now? The jailers are very angry, for he gave them no rest. It became quiet in the upper corridor, and the watchwoman finished her story, how she was frightened when she saw the peasant flogged, and how it turned her stomach. Miss Dandy told how Shedslov was flogged with a lash while he never uttered a word. Theodosia then removed the pots and bowls, Korableva and the watchwoman took to their sewing, while Maslova, hugging her knees, became sad from ennui. She was about to lay down to sleep when the matron called her into the office, where a visitor was waiting for her. Don't fail to tell him about us, said the old Menshova, while Maslova was arranging her headgear before a looking-glass half void of mercury. It was not me who set the fire, but he, the villain, himself did it, and the labourer saw it. He would not kill a man. 
Tell him to call Dimitri. Dimitri will explain to him everything. They locked us up here for nothing while the villain is living with another man's wife and sits around in dram shops. That's wrong, affirmed Korobleva. I will tell him. Yes, I will, answered Maslova. Suppose we have a drink for courage, she added, winking one eye. Korobleva poured out half a cup for her. Maslova drank it and wiped her mouth. Her spirits rose, and repeating the words, for courage, shaking her head and smiling, she followed the matron. Chapter 45 Nekludov had been waiting for a long time in the vestibule. Arriving at the prison, he rang the front door bell and handed his pass to the warden on duty. What do you want? I wish to see the prisoner Maslova. Can't see her now. The inspector is busy. In the office? asked Nekludov. No, here in the visitor's room, the warden answered, somewhat embarrassed, as it seemed to Nekludov. Why, are visitors admitted today? No, special business, he answered. Where can I see him then? He will come out presently. Wait. At that moment, a sergeant major in bright crown-laced uniform, his face radiant, and his moustache impregnated with smoke, appeared from a side door. Why did you admit him here? What is the office for? He said sternly, turning to the warden. I was told that the inspector was here, said Nekludov, surprised at the embarrassment noticeable on the officer's face. At that moment, the inner door opened, and Petrov, flushed and perspiring, came out. He will remember it, he said, turning to the sergeant major. The latter pointed with his eyes to Nekludov, and Petrov became silent, frowned and walked out through the rear door. Who will remember? What? Why are they all so embarrassed? Why did the sergeant make that sign? thought Nekludov. You cannot wait here. Please walk into the office. The sergeant major turned to Nekludov, who was about to go out when the inspector came in through the inner door, more embarrassed even than his assistants. He was sighing incessantly. Seeing Nekludov, he turned to the warden. Fedotov, call Maslova. Follow me, please, he said to Nekludov. They passed up a winding stairway leading into a small room with one window and containing a writing table and a few chairs. The inspector sat down. Mine are disagreeable duties, he said, turning to Nekludov and lighting a thick cigarette. You seem tired, said Nekludov. I am very tired of all this business. My duties are very onerous. I am trying my best to alleviate the condition of the prisoners, and things are getting only worse. I am very anxious to get away from here. The duties are very, very unpleasant. Nekludov could not understand what it was that made it so unpleasant for the inspector, but today he noticed on the inspector's face an expression of despondency and hopelessness which was pitiful to behold. Yes, I think they are very trying, he said. But why do you not resign? I have a family, and am without means. But if it is difficult... Well, you see, I managed to improve somewhat their lot after all. Another one in my place would hardly exert himself as I do. It is no easy matter to handle two thousand people. They are all so human, and one feels pity for them, and yet they can't be allowed to have all their own way and the inspector related the case of a recent fight among the prisoners which ended in murder. His story was interrupted by the entrance of Maslova, who was preceded by the warden. Nekludov got sight of her when she appeared on the threshold and before she saw the inspector. Her face was red, and she walked briskly behind the warden, smiling and shaking her head. Noticing the inspector, she gazed at him with frightened face, but immediately recovered herself and boldly and cheerfully turned to Nekludov. How do you do? she said, drawlingly, smiling and vigorously shaking his hand, not as on the former occasion. Here I have brought you the petition to sign, said Nekludov, somewhat surprised at the forward manner in which she accosted him. The lawyer wrote it. It must be signed and sent to St. Petersburg. Why, certainly. I will do anything, she said, winking one eye and smiling. May she sign it here? Nekludov asked of the inspector. Come here and sit down, said the inspector. Here is a pen for you. Can you write? I could write once, 
she said, smiling, and arranging her skirt and waist sleeve, sat down, clumsily took the pen into her small, energetic hand, began to laugh and looked round at Nekhludoff. He pointed out to her where to sign. Diligently dipping and shaking the pen, she signed her name. Do you wish anything else? she asked, looking now at Nekhludoff, now at the inspector, and depositing the pen now on the inkstand, now on the paper. I wish to tell you something, said Nekhludoff, taking the pen from her hand. Very well, go on, she uttered, and suddenly, as though meditating or growing sleepy, her face became grave. The inspector rose and walked out, leaving Nekhludoff with her alone. Chapter 46 The warden who brought Maslova to the office seated himself on the window sill, away from the table. This was a decisive moment for Nekhludoff. He had been constantly reproaching himself for not telling her at their first meeting of his intention to marry her, and was now determined to do so. She was sitting on one side of the table, and Nekhludoff seated himself on the other side, opposite her. The room was well lighted, and for the first time Nekhludoff clearly saw her face from a short distance and noticed wrinkles around the eyes and lips and a slight swelling under her eyes, and he pitied her even more than before. Resting his elbows on the table so that he should not be heard by the warden, whose face was of a Jewish type, with greyish side whiskers, he said, If this petition fails, we will appeal to His Majesty. Nothing will be left undone. If it had been done before, if I had had a good lawyer, she interrupted him. That lawyer of mine was such a little fool. He was only making me compliments, she said, and began to laugh. If they had only known that I was your acquaintance, it would have been different. They think that everybody is a thief. How strange she is today, thought Nekhludoff, and was about to tell her what he had on his mind when she again began to speak. I wanted to tell you. There is an old woman here. We are even surprised. Such a good little woman, but there she is. She and her son, both in prison, and everybody knows that they are innocent. They are accused of setting fire, so they are in prison. She learned, you know, that I am acquainted with you, said Maslova, turning her head and casting glances at him, and she says to me, Tell him, she says, to call my son. He will tell him the whole story. Menshoff is his name. Well, will you do it? Such a good little woman. You can see for yourself that she is not guilty. You will help them, dear, won't you? She said, glancing at him. Then she lowered her eyes and smiled. Very well, I will do it, said Nekhludoff, his surprise at her easy manner growing. But I would like to talk to you about my own affair. Do you remember what I told you that time? You have spoken so much. What did you say that time? she said, continuing to smile and turning her head now to one side, now to the other. I said that I came to ask your forgiveness, he said. Oh, forgiveness, forgiveness. That is all nonsense. You had better. That I wish to atone for my sin, continued Nekhludoff, and to atone not by words but by deed, I have decided to marry you. Her face suddenly showed fright. Her squinting eyes became fixed, and they looked and did not look at him. What is that for? And she frowned maliciously. I feel that before God I must do it. What God? Now, are you talking about? You are not talking to the point. God? What God? Why didn't you think of God then? She said, and opening her mouth, stopped short. Nekhludoff only now smelled a strong odour of liquor, and understood the cause of her excitement. Be calm, he said. I have nothing to be calm about. You think I am drunk? Yes, I am drunk, but I know what I am talking about, she said quickly, and her face became purple. I am a convict, while you are a lord, a prince, and needn't stay here to soil your hands. Go to your princesses. You cannot be too cruel to me. You do not know how I feel he said in a low voice, his whole body trembling. You cannot imagine how strongly I feel my guilt before you. Feel my guilt, she mocked him maliciously. You did not feel it then, 
but thrust a hundred roubles in my hands. That's your price. I know, I know, but what am I to do now? I have decided not to leave you, he repeated, and what I say I will do. And I say that you will not, she said, and laughed aloud. Katinsha, he began, leave me. I am a convict, and you are a prince, and you have no business here, she shrieked, violently releasing her hand from his, her wrath knowing no limit. You wish to save yourself through me, she continued, hastening to pour out all that had accumulated in her soul. You have made me the means of your enjoyment in life, and now you wish to make me the means of saving you after death. You disgust me, as do your eyeglasses and that fat, dirty face of yours. Go, go away, she shrieked, energetically springing to her feet. The warden approached them. Don't you make so much noise. You know whom? Please desist, said Nekludov. She must not forget herself, said the warden. Please wait a while, said Nekludov. The warden returned to his seat on the window sill. Maslova again seated herself, her eyes downcast and her little hands clutching each other. Nekludov stood over her, not knowing what to do. You do not believe me, he said, that you wish to marry me? That will never happen. I will sooner hang myself. But I will serve you anyway. That is your business. Only I don't want anything from you. Now, that is certain, she said. Oh, why did I not die then? She added, and began to cry piteously. Nekludov could not speak. Her tears called forth tears in his own eyes. She raised her eyes, looked at him, as if surprised, and with her kerchief began to wipe the tears streaming down her cheeks. The warden again approached them and reminded them that it was time to part. Maslova rose. You are excited now. If possible, I will call tomorrow. Meantime, think it over, said Nekludov. She made no answer, and without looking at him, left the room, preceded by the warden. Well, girl, good times are coming said Korobleva to Maslova when the latter returned to the cell. He seems to be stuck on you, so make the most of it while he is calling. He will get you released. The rich can do anything. That's so, drawled the watchwoman. The poor man will think ten times before he will marry, while the rich man can satisfy his every whim. Yes, my dear, there was a respectable man in our village, and he... Have you spoken to him of my case? asked the old woman. But Maslova was silent. She lay down on her bunk, gazing with her squinting eyes into the corner, and remained in that position till evening. Her soul was in torment. That which Nekludov told her opened to her that world in which she had suffered and which she had left, hating without understanding it. She had now lost that forgetfulness in which she had lived, and to live with a clear recollection of the past was painful. In the evening, she again bought wine, which she drank with her fellow prisoners. Chapter 47 So that is how it is, thought Nekludov as he made his way out of the prison, and he only now realized the extent of his guilt. Had he not attempted to efface and atone for his conduct, he should never have felt all the infamy of it, nor she all the wrong perpetrated against her. Only now it all came out in all its horror. He now for the first time perceived how her soul had been debased, and she finally understood it. At first, Nekludov had played with his feelings and delighted in his own contrition. Now he was simply horrified. He now felt that to abandon her was impossible, and yet he could not see the result of these relations. At the prison gate, someone handed Nekludov a note. He read it when on the street. The note was written in a bold hand, with pencil, and contained the following. Having learned that you are visiting the prison, I thought it would be well to see you. You can see me by asking the authorities for an interview with me. I will tell you something very important to your protégé as well as to the politicals. Thankfully, Vera Bogodukovskaya. Bogodukovskaya? Who is Bogodukovskaya? thought Nekludov entirely absorbed in the impression of his meeting with Maslova, and failing at the first moment to recall either the name or the handwriting. Oh, yes, he suddenly recalled. 
the deacon's daughter, at the bear hunt. Vera Bogodukovskaya was a teacher in the obscure district of Novgorod, whither Nekludov, on one occasion, went bear hunting with his friends. This teacher had asked Nekludov to give her some money to enable her to study. He gave it to her, and the incident dropped from his memory. And now it seemed that this lady was a political prisoner, had probably learned his history in prison, and was now offering her services. At that time, everything was easy and simple. Now everything was difficult and complex. Nekludov readily and joyfully recalled that time and his acquaintance with Bogodukovskaya. It was on the eve of Shrovatide, in the wilds about sixty versts from the railroad. The hunt was successful. Two bears were bagged, and they were dining before their journey home, when the woodsman, in whose hut they were stopping, came to tell them that the deacon's daughter had come and wished to see Prince Nekludov. Is she good-looking? someone asked. Come, come, said Nekludov, rising, and wondering why the deacon's daughter should want him, assumed a grave expression and went to the woodsman's hut. In the hut there was a girl in a felt hat and short fur coat, sinewy, and with an ugly and unpleasant face, relieved, however, by her pleasant eyes and raised eyebrows. This is the prince, Vera Efremovna, said the old hostess. I will leave you. What can I do for you? asked Nekludov. I, I, you see, you are rich and throw away your money on trifles on a chase. I know, began the girl, becoming confused, but I wish but one thing. I wish to be useful to people, and can do nothing because I know nothing. What then can I do for you? I am a teacher, and would like to enter college, but they don't let me. It is not exactly that they don't let me, but we have no means. Let me have some money. When I am through with my studies, I shall return it to you. Her eyes were truthful and kindly and the expression of resolution and timidity on her face was so touching that Nekludov, as it was usual with him, suddenly mentally placed himself in her position, understood and pitied her. I think it is wrong for rich people to kill bears and get the peasants drunk. Why don't they make themselves useful? I only need eighty roubles. Oh, if you don't wish to, it is all the same to me, she said angrily, interpreting the grave expression on Nekludov's face to her disadvantage. On the contrary, I am very thankful to you for the opportunity. When she understood that he consented, her face turned a purple colour and she became silent. I will fetch it immediately, said Nekludov. He went into the entrance hall where he found an eavesdropping friend. Without taking notice of his comrade's jests, he took the money from his handbag and brought it to her. Please don't be thanking me. It is I who ought to be thankful to you. It was pleasant to Nekludov to recall all that. It was pleasant to recall how he came near quarrelling with the army officer who attempted to make a bad joke of it, how another comrade sided with him, which drew them more closely together, how merry and successful was the hunt, and how happy he felt that night returning to the railroad station. A long file of sleighs moved noiselessly in pairs at a gentle trot along the narrow, fur-lined path of the forests, which were covered with a heavy layer of snowflakes. Someone struck a red light in the dark, and the pleasant aroma of a good cigarette was wafted toward him. Osip, the sleigh tender, ran from sleigh to sleigh, knee-deep in snow, telling of the elks that were roaming in the deep snow, nibbling the bark of aspen trees, and of the bears emitting their warm breath through the air holes of their wild haunts. Nekludov remembered all that, and above all the happy consciousness of his own health, strength and freedom from care. His lungs, straining his tight-fitting fur coat, inhaled the frosty air. The trees, grazed by the shaft, sent showers of white flakes into his face. His body was warm, his face ruddy. His soul was without a care or blemish or fear or desire. How happy he was! But now, my God, how painful and unbearable it all was! Chapter 48 Rising the next morning, Nekludov recalled the events of the previous day and was seized with fear. But notwithstanding this fear, 
he was even more determined than before to carry out his plan already begun. With this consciousness of the duty that lay upon him, he drove to Maslenikov for permission to visit in jail, besides Maslova, the old woman Menshova and her son, of whom Maslova had spoken to him. Besides, he also wished to see Bogodukovskaya, who might be useful to Maslova. Nekludov had known Maslenikov since they together served in the army. Maslenikov was the treasurer of the regiment. He was the most kind-hearted officer and possessed executive ability. Nothing in society was of any interest to him, and he was entirely absorbed in the affairs of the regiment. Nekludov now found him an administrator in the civil government. He was married to a rich and energetic woman to whom was due his change of occupation. She laughed at him and patted him as she would a tamed animal. Nekludov had visited them once the previous winter, but the couple seemed so uninteresting to him that he never called again. Maslenikov's face became radiant when he saw Nekludov. His face was as fat and red, his dress as excellent as when he served in the army. As an army officer, he was always neat, dressed in a tight uniform made according to the latest style. Now his dress fitted his well-fed body as perfectly. He wore a uniform. Notwithstanding the difference in their age, Maslenikov was about forty. They familiarly thawed each other. Very glad you remembered me. Come to my wife. I have just ten minutes to spare, and then I must to the session. My chief, you know, is away. I am directing the affairs of the district, he said, with joy which he could not conceal. I came to you on business. What's that? Maslenikov said in a frightened and somewhat stern voice, suddenly pricking his ears. There is a person in jail in whom I am very much interested. At the word jail, Maslenikov's face became even more stern and I would like to have the right of interview in the office instead of the common reception room, and oftener than on the appointed days. I was told that it depended on you. Of course, mon cher, I'm always ready to do anything for you, Maslenikov said, touching his knees with both hands, as if desiring to soften his own greatness. I can do it, but you know I am caliph only for an hour. So you can give me a pass that will enable me to see her. It is a woman? Yes. What is the charge against her? Poisoning, but she was irregularly convicted. Yes, there is justice for you. Ils n'en font point d'autre, he said, for some reason in French. I know that you do not agree with me, but c'est mon opinion bien arrêté, he added, repeating the opinion that had been reiterated during the past year by a retrograde conservative newspaper. I know you are a liberal. I don't know whether I am a liberal or something else, smilingly said Nekludov, who always wondered at being joined to some party, or called a liberal only because he held that a man must not be judged without being heard, that all are equal before the law, that it is wrong to torture and beat people generally, especially those that are not convicted. I don't know whether I am a liberal or not, but I do know that our present courts, bad as they are, are nevertheless better than those that preceded them. And what lawyer have you retained? I have retained Fanarin. Ah, Fanarin, Maslenikov said, frowning as he recalled how Fanarin, examining him as a witness the year before, in the most polite manner made him the butt of ridicule. I would not advise you to have anything to do with him. Fanarin est un homme tar. I have another request to make of you, Nekludov said, without answering him. A long time ago I made the acquaintance of a girl teacher, a very wretched creature. She is now in jail and desires to see me. Can you give me a pass to her? Maslenikov leaned his head to one side and began to reflect. She is a political. Yes, I was told so. You know politicals can only be seen by their relatives, but I will give you a general pass. Je sais que vous n'abuserez pas. What is the name of this, your protégé? Bogodukovskaya? Elle est jolie? Hideuse. Maslenikov disapprovingly shook his head, went to the table, and on a sheet of paper with a printed letterhead, wrote in a bold hand. The bearer, Prince Dmitri Ivanovich Nekludov, is hereby permitted to visit the prisoners, Maslova and Bogodukovskaya, now detained in the prison, 
and signed his name to it with a broad flourish. You will see now what order there is in prison, and to keep order there is very difficult, because it is overcrowded, especially by those to be transported. But I watch over them, and like the occupation. You will see there are very many there, but they are content and are faring well. It is necessary to know how to deal with them. Some unpleasantness occurred there a few days ago. Disobedience. Another man in my place would have treated it as a riot and made many people miserable, but we arranged it all pleasantly. What is necessary is solicitude on the one hand and prompt and vigorous dealing on the other, he said, clenching his soft white fist projecting from under a white starched cuff and adorned with a turquoise ring. Solicitude and vigorous dealing. Well, I don't know about that, said Nekhludoff. I was there twice and I was very much distressed by the sight. You know what I will tell you? You ought to get acquainted with Princess Pasek, continued Maslenikov, who had become talkative. She has entirely devoted herself to this cause. Elle fait beaucoup de bien. Thanks to her and without false modesty to myself, everything has been changed and changed so that none of the old horrors can be found there, and they are decidedly well off there. You will see it. There is Fanarin. I am not personally acquainted with him. Besides, our roads do not meet because of my position in society, but he is decidedly a bad man and allows himself to state in court such things, such things. Well, thank you, said Nekhludoff, taking the document, and took leave of his old comrade. Would you not like to see my wife? No, thank you. I have no time now. Well, now, she will never forgive me said Maslenikov, conducting his old comrade to the first landing, as he did with people of secondary importance, among whom he reckoned Nekhludoff. Do come but for a moment. But Nekhludoff was firm, and while the footman and porter sprang toward him, handing him his overcoat and cane, and opening the door, before which a policeman stood, he excused himself, pleading want of time. Well then, Thursday, please. That is her reception day. I will tell her, Maslenikov shouted from the top of the stairs. Chapter 49 From Maslenikov, Nekhludoff went directly to the prison and approached the familiar apartments of the inspector. The sounds of a tuneless piano again assailed his ears, but this time it was not a rhapsody that was played, but a study by Clementi, and, as before, with unusual force, precision and rapidity. The servant, with a handkerchief around one eye, said that the captain was in, and showed Nekhludoff into the small reception room in which was a lounge, a table and a lamp, one side of the rose-coloured shade of which was scorched, standing on a knitted woollen napkin. The inspector appeared with an expression of sadness and torment on his face. "'Glad to see you. What can I do for you?' he said, buttoning up the middle button of his uniform. I went to the vice-governor, and here is my pass, said Nekhludoff, handing him the document. I would like to see Maslova. Markova, asked the inspector, who could not hear him on account of the music. Maslova. Oh, yes, oh, yes. The inspector rose and approached the door through which Clementi's roulade was heard. Marussia, if you would only stop for a little while, he said in a voice which showed that this music was the cross of his life. I cannot hear anything. The music ceased. Discontented steps were heard, and someone looked through the door. The inspector, as if relieved by the cessation of the music, lit a thick cigarette of light tobacco, and offered one to Nekhludoff, which he refused. Can Maslova? It is not convenient to see Maslova today, said the inspector. Why? It is your own fault, slightly smiling, said the inspector. Prince, you must not give her any money. If you wish to give her money, leave it with me. I will keep it for her. You see, you must have given her money yesterday, for she bought wine. It is hard to eradicate that evil, and is intoxicated today. In fact, she became unruly. Is it possible? Why, I even had to employ strict measures, had her transferred to another cell. She is very tractable, but please do not give her money. That is their failing. Nekhludoff quickly recalled the incident of yesterday, 
and he was seized with fear. And may I see Bogodukovskaya, the political? Nekhludoff asked after some silence. Well, yes, said the inspector. What are you doing here? He turned to a five-year-old girl who came into the room, walking toward her father, her eyes riveted on Nekhludoff. Look out, or you will fall, he said, smiling, as the little girl, walking with her head turned toward Nekhludoff, tripped on the carpet and ran to her father. If she may be seen, I would go now. Oh, yes, she may be seen, of course, said the inspector, embracing the little girl, who was still looking at Nekhludoff. All right. The inspector rose and, gently turning the girl aside, walked into the vestibule. He had scarcely donned the overcoat handed him by the girl with the bandaged eye and crossed the threshold when the distinct sounds of Clementi's roulade broke out. She was at the conservatory, but there is disorder in that institution. But she is very gifted, said the inspector, walking down the stairs. She intends to appear at concerts. The inspector and Nekhludoff neared the prison. The wicket immediately opened at the approach of the inspector. The wardens, standing to attention, followed him with their eyes. Four men with heads half-shaved, carrying large vessels, met him in the vestibule, and as they spied him, slunk back. One of them, in a particularly gloomy way, knit his brow, his black eyes flashing fire. Of course, her talent must be perfected. It cannot be neglected. But in a small apartment it is hard, you know. The inspector continued the conversation without paying any attention to the prisoners and dragging his tired legs passed into the meeting room, followed by Nekhludoff. Whom do you wish to see? asked the inspector. Bogodukovskaya. That is from the tower. You will have to wait a little, he turned to Nekhludoff. Couldn't you let me see, meantime, the prisoners Menshov, mother and son, who are charged with incendiarism? That is from cell 21. Why, yes, they may be called out. Would you allow me to see the sun in his cell? It is quieter in the meeting room, but it is interesting to see him there. Interesting! At that moment, a dashing officer, the inspector's assistant, appeared at a side door. Conduct the prince to Menshoff's cell. No, 21, said the inspector to his assistant. Then show him to the office, and I will call. What is her name? Vera Bogodukovskaya, said Nekhludoff. The inspector's assistant was a light-haired young officer with dyed moustache who spread around him the odour of perfume. Follow me, please. He turned to Nekhludoff with a pleasant smile. Does our institution interest you? Yes, and I am also interested in that man who, I was told, is innocent. The assistant shrugged his shoulders. Yes, that may be he said calmly, courteously admitting the guest into the ill-smelling corridor. But they also lie often. Walk in, please. The doors of the cells were open, and some prisoners stood in the corridor, slightly nodding to the wardens and looking askance at the prisoners, who either pressed against the walls, entered their cells, or, stopping at the doors, stood erect like soldiers. The assistant escorted Nekhludoff through one corridor into another, on the left, which was iron-bolted. This corridor was darker and more ill-smelling than the first. There was a row of cells on each side, the doors of which were locked. There was a hole in each door, eyelet, so called, of about an inch in diameter. There was no one in this corridor except an old warden with a wrinkled, sad face. Where is Menshov's cell? asked the assistant. The eighth one on the left. Are these occupied? asked Nekhludoff. All but one. Chapter 50 May I look in? asked Nekhludoff. If you please, the assistant said with a pleasant smile and began to make inquiries of the warden. Nekhludoff looked through one of the openings. A tall young man with a small black beard, clad only in his linen, walked rapidly up and down the floor of his cell. Hearing a rustle at the door, he looked up, frowned, and continued to walk. Nekhludoff looked into the second opening. His eye met another large, frightened eye. He hastily moved away. Looking into the third, he saw a small-sized man sleeping curled up on a cot, his head covered with his prison coat. In the fourth cell, 
a broad-faced, pale-looking man sat with lowered head, his elbows resting on his knees. Hearing steps, this man raised his head and looked up. In his face and eyes was an expression of hopeless anguish. He was apparently unconcerned about who it was that looked into his cell, whoever it might be. He evidently hoped for no good from anyone. Nekhludoff was seized with fear, and he hastened to number 21, Menshov's cell. The warden unlocked and opened the door. A young, muscular man with a long neck, kindly round eyes and small beard stood beside his cot, hastily donning his prison coat and, with frightened face, looking at the two men who had entered. Nekhludoff was particularly struck by the kindly round eyes whose wondering and startled look ran from him to the warden and back. This gentleman wishes to ask you about your case. Thank you. Yes, I was told about your case, said Nekhludoff, going into the depth of the cell and stopping at the barred, dirty window, and would like to hear it from yourself. Menshov also drew near the window and immediately began to relate the particulars of his case, at first timidly from time to time glancing at the warden, then growing bolder and bolder, and when the warden had left the cell to give some orders, his timidity left him entirely. Judging by his speech and manner, his was a story of a simple, honest peasant, and it seemed very strange to Nekhludoff to hear it from the lips of a prisoner in the garb of disgrace and in prison. While listening to him, Nekhludoff examined the low cot with its straw mattress, the window with its thick iron bars, the damp, plastered walls, the pitiful face and the figure of the unfortunate, mutilated peasant in bast shoes and prison coat, and he became sad. He would not believe that what this kind-hearted man told him was true, and it was still harder to think that this truthful story should be false, and that kindly face should deceive him. His story, in short, was that soon after his wedding, a tapster enticed away his wife. He had recourse to the law everywhere, and the tapster was everywhere acquitted. Once he took her away by force, but she ran away the following day. He went to the seducer, demanding his wife. The tapster told him that she was not there, although he saw her when coming in and ordered him to depart. He would not go. Then the tapster and another workman beat him until he bled, and the following day the tapster's house took fire. He and his mother were charged with incendiarism, although at the time the fire broke out, he was visiting a friend. And you really did not set the fire? I never even thought of such a thing, master. The villain must have done it himself. They say that he had just insured his house, and he said that I and my mother came and threatened him. It is true I abused him at that time, couldn't help it, but I did not set the fire, and was not even in the neighbourhood when the fire started. He set the fire purposely on the day I was there with my mother. He did it for the insurance money and threw it on us. Is it possible? As true as there is a living God, Master. Do help us. He was about to bow to the ground, but Nekhludoff forcibly prevented him. Release me. I am suffering here innocently, he continued. His face suddenly began to twitch. Tears welled up in his eyes, and rolling up the sleeve of his coat, he began to wipe his eyes with the dirty sleeve of his shirt. Have you finished? asked the warden. Yes. Cheer up. I will do what I can for you, Nekhludoff said, and walked out. Menshoff stood in the door, so that when the warden closed it, he pushed him in. While the warden was locking the door, Menshoff looked through the hole. Chapter 51 It was dinner time when Nekhludoff retraced his steps through the wide corridor and the cells were open. The prisoners, in light yellow coats, short, wide trousers and prison shoes, eyed him greedily. Nekhludoff experienced strange feelings and commiseration for the prisoners, and for some reason shame that he should so calmly view it. In one of the corridors, a man, clattering with his prison shoes, ran into one of the cells, and immediately a crowd of people came out, placed themselves in his way, and bowed. Your Excellency, I don't know what to call you. Please order that our case be decided. I am not the commander. I do not know anything. No matter. Tell them 
the authorities, or somebody, said an indignant voice, to look into our case. We are guilty of no offence and have been in prison the second month now. How so? Why? asked Nekhludoff. We don't know ourselves why, but we have been here the second month. That is true, said the assistant inspector. They were taken because they had no passports, and they were to be transported to their district, but the prison had burned down there, and the authorities asked us to keep them here. Those belonging to other districts were transported, but these we keep here. Is that the only reason? asked Nekhludoff, stopping in the doorway. The crowd, consisting of about forty men, all in prison garb, surrounded Nekhludoff and the assistant. Several voices began talking at once. The assistant stopped them. Let one of you speak. A tall old man of good mien came forward. He told Nekhludoff that they were all imprisoned on the ground that they had no passports, but that, as a matter of fact, they had passports which had expired and were not renewed for about two weeks. It happened every year, but they were never even fined, and now they were imprisoned like criminals. We are all masons and belong to the same association. They say that the prison has burned down, but that isn't our fault. For God's sake, help us. Nekhludoff listened, but scarcely understood what the old man was saying. How is that? Can it be possible that they are kept in prison for that sole reason? said Nekhludoff, turning to the assistant. Yes, they ought to be sent to their homes, said the assistant. At that moment, a small-sized man, also in prison attire, pushed his way through the crowd and began to complain excitedly that they were being tortured without any cause. Worse than dogs, he began. Tut! Tut! Do not talk too much, or else you know... Know what? said the little man desperately. Are we guilty of anything? Silence! shouted the assistant, and the little man subsided. What a peculiar state of things! Nekhludoff said to himself, as he ran the gauntlet, as it were, of a hundred eyes that followed him through the corridor. Is it possible that innocent people are held in durance here? Nekhludoff said, when they emerged from the corridor. What can we do? However, many of them are lying. If you ask them, they all claim to be innocent, said the assistant inspector, although some are there really without any cause whatever. But these masons don't seem to be guilty of any offence. That is true so far as the masons are concerned. But those people are spoiled. Some measure of severity is necessary. They are not all as innocent as they look. Only yesterday we were obliged to punish two of them. Punish? How? asked Nekhludoff. By flogging. It was ordered. But corporal punishment has been abolished. Not for those that have been deprived of civil rights. Nekhludoff recalled what he had seen the other day while waiting in the vestibule and understood that the punishment had then been taking place and with peculiar force came upon him that mingled feeling of curiosity, sadness, doubt and moral almost passing over into physical nausea which he had felt before but never with such force. Without listening to the assistant or looking around him, he hastily passed through the corridor and ascended to the office. The inspector was in the corridor and busying himself with some affair had forgot to send for Bogodukovskaya. He only called it to mind when Nekhludoff entered the office. I will send for her immediately. Take a seat, he said. Chapter 52 The office consisted of two rooms. In the first room, which had two dirty windows and the plastering on the walls peeled off, a black measuring rod for determining the height of prisoners stood in one corner, while in another hung a picture of Christ. A few wardens stood around in this room. In the second room, in groups and pairs, about twenty men and women were sitting along the walls, talking in low voices. A writing table stood near one of the windows. The inspector seated himself at the writing table and offered Nekhludoff a chair standing nearby. Nekhludoff seated himself and began to examine the people in the room. His attention was first of all attracted by a young man with a pleasant face, wearing a short jacket, who was standing before a man prisoner and a girl, gesticulating and talking to them in a heated manner. 
Beside them sat an old man in blue eyeglasses, immovably holding the hand of a woman in prison garb and listening to her. A boy in high school uniform with an expression of fright on his face stood gazing on the old man. Not far from them, in the corner, a pair of lovers were sitting. She was a very young, pretty, stylishly dressed girl with short cropped flaxen hair and an energetic face. He was a fine featured, handsome youth with wavy hair and in a prison coat. They occupied the corner, whispering to each other, apparently wrapped in their love. Nearest of all to the table was a grey haired woman in black, evidently the mother of a consumptive young man in a rubber jacket who stood before her. Her eyes were fixed on him and her tears prevented her speaking, which she several times attempted to do, but was forced to desist. The young man held a piece of paper in his hand, and evidently not knowing what to do with an angry expression on his face, was folding and crumpling it. Sitting beside the weeping mother and patting her on the shoulder was a stout, pretty girl with red cheeks in a grey dress and cape. Everything in this girl was beautiful, the white hands, the wavy, short hair, the strong nose and lips, but the principal charm of her face were her hazel, kindly, truthful sheep eyes. Her beautiful eyes turned on Nekhludoff at the moment he entered and met his, but she immediately turned them again on her mother and whispered to her something. Not far from the lovers, a dark man with gloomy face sat talking angrily to a clean-shaven visitor resembling a scopet a sect of castrates. At the very door stood a young man in a rubber jacket, evidently more concerned about the impression he was making on the visitors than what he was saying. Nekhludoff sat down beside the inspector and looked around him with intense curiosity. He was amused by a short-haired boy coming near him and asking him in a shrill voice, And whom are you waiting for? The question surprised Nekhludoff but seeing the boy's serious, intelligent face with bright, attentive eyes gravely answered that he was awaiting a woman acquaintance. Well, is she your sister? asked the boy. No, she is not my sister, Nekhludoff answered with surprise. And with whom are you? I am with Mama. She is a political, said the boy. Maria Pavlovna, take away Kolia, said the inspector evidently finding Nekhludoff's conversation with the boy contrary to the law. Maria Pavlovna, the same beautiful woman who had attracted Nekhludoff's attention, rose and with heavy, long strides approached him. What is he asking you? Who you are? she asked, slightly smiling with her beautifully curved lips and confidingly looking at him with her prominent, kindly eyes, as though expecting Nekhludoff to know that her relations to everybody always have been, are and ought to be simple, affable, and brotherly. He must know everything, she said, and smiled into the face of the boy with such a kindly, charming smile that both the boy and Nekhludoff involuntarily also smiled. Yes, he asked me whom I came to see. Maria Pavlovna, you know that it is not permitted to speak to strangers, said the inspector. All right, she said, and taking the little hand of the boy into her own white hand, she returned to the consumptive's mother. Whose boy is that? Nekhludoff asked the inspector. He is the son of a political prisoner and was born in prison. Is it possible? Yes, and now he is following his mother to Siberia. And that girl? I cannot answer it, said the inspector, shrugging his shoulders. Ah, there is Bogodukovskaya. Chapter 53 The short-haired, lean, yellow-faced Vera Efremovna, with her large, kindly eyes, entered timidly through the rear door. Well, I thank you for coming here, she said, pressing Nekhludoff's hand. You remember me. Let us sit down. I did not expect to find you here. Oh, I am doing excellently, so well indeed that I desire nothing better, said Vera Efremovna, looking frightened as usual, with her kindly round eyes at Nekhludoff, and turning her very thin, sinewy neck, which projected from under the crumpled, dirty collar of her waist. Nekhludoff asked her how she came to be in prison, 
She related her case to him with great animation. Her discourse was interspersed with foreign scientific terms about propaganda, disorganization, groups, sections and subsections, which, she was perfectly certain, everybody knew, but of which Nekhludoff had never even heard. She was evidently sure that it was both interesting and pleasant to him to know all that she was relating. Nekhludoff, however, looked at her pitiful neck, her thin, tangled hair, and wondered why she was telling him all that. He pitied her, but not as he pitied the peasant Menshoff with his hands and face white as potato sprouts and innocently languishing in an ill-smelling prison. He pitied her on account of the evident confusion that reigned in her head. She seemed to consider herself a heroine and showed off before him, and this made her particularly pitiful. This trait Nekhludoff noticed in other people then in the room. His arrival attracted their attention, and he felt that they changed their demeanour because of his presence. This trait was also present in the young man in the rubber jacket, in the woman in prison clothes, and even in the actions of the two lovers. The only people who did not possess this trait were the consumptive young man, the beautiful girl with sheep eyes, and the dark-featured man who was talking to the beardless man who resembled a scopetz. The affair of which Vera Efremovna wished to speak to Nekhludoff consisted of the following. A chum of hers, Shustova, who did not even belong to her subsection, was arrested because in her dwelling were found books and papers which had been left with her for safe keeping. Vera Efremovna thought that it was partly her fault that Shustova was imprisoned and implored Nekhludoff, who was well connected, to do everything in his power to effect her release. Of herself, she related that, after having graduated as midwife, she joined some party. At first, everything went on smoothly, but afterward, one of the party was caught, the papers were seized, and then all were taken in a police dragnet. They also took me, and now I am going to be transported, she wound up her story. But that is nothing. I feel excellently, and she smiled piteously. Nekhludoff asked her about the girl with the sheep eyes, and Vera Efremovna told him that she was the daughter of a general, that she had assumed the guilt of another person, and was now going to serve at hard labour in Siberia. An altruistic, honest person, said Vera Efremovna. The other case of which Vera Efremovna wished to speak concerned Maslova. As the history of every prisoner was known to everyone in prison, she knew Maslova's history, and advised him to procure her removal to the ward for politicals or, at least, to the hospital, which was just now crowded, requiring a larger staff of nurses. Nekhludoff said that he could hardly do anything, but promised to make an attempt when he reached St. Petersburg. Chapter 54 Their conversation was interrupted by the inspector, who announced that it was time to depart. Nekhludoff rose, took leave of Vera Efremovna, and strode to the door, where he stopped to observe what was taking place before him. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is up, said the inspector as he was going out. But neither visitors nor prisoners stirred. The inspector's demand only called forth greater animation, but no one thought of departing. Some got up and talked standing, some continued to talk sitting, others began to cry and take leave. The young man continued to crumple the bit of paper, and he made such a good effort to remain calm that his face seemed to bear an angry expression. His mother, hearing that the visit was over, fell on his shoulder and began to sob. The girl with the sheep eyes, Nekhludoff involuntarily followed her movements, stood before the sobbing mother, pouring words of consolation into her ear. The old man with the blue eyeglasses held his daughter by the hand and nodded affirmatively to her words. The young lovers rose, holding each other's hands and silently looking into each other's eyes. Those are the only happy people here, said the young man in the rubber jacket who stood near Nekhludoff, pointing to the young lovers. Seeing the glances of Nekhludoff and the young man, the lovers, the convict and the flaxen-haired girl, stretched their clasping hands threw back their heads and began to dance in a circle. They will be married this evening in the prison, and she will go with him to Siberia, said the young man. Who is he then? 
He is a penal convict. Although they are making merry, it is very painful to listen, added the young man, listening to the sobbing of the old man with the blue eyeglasses. Please, please don't compel me to take severe measures, said the inspector, several times repeating the same thing. Please, please, he said, weakly and irresolutely. Well, now this cannot go on. Please, now come. For the last time I repeat it, he said, in a sad voice, seating himself and rising again, lighting and then extinguishing his cigarette. Finally, the prisoners and visitors began to depart, the former passing through the inner, the latter through the outer door. First, the man in the rubber coat passed out, then the consumptive and the dark-featured convict. Next, Vera Efremovna and Maria Pavlovna, and the boy who was born in the prison. The visitors also filed out. The old man with the blue eyeglasses started with a heavy gait, and after him came Nekludov. What a peculiar state of things, said the talkative young man to Nekludov on the stairs, as though continuing the interrupted conversation. It is fortunate that the captain is a kind-hearted man and does not enforce the rules, but for him it would be tantalizing. As it is, they talk together and relieve their feelings. When Nekludov, talking to this man, who gave his name as Medintsev, reached the entrance hall, the inspector, with weary countenance, approached him. So, if you wish to see Maslova, then please call tomorrow, he said, evidently desiring to be pleasant. Very well, said Nekludov, and hastened away. As on the former occasion, besides pity, he was seized with a feeling of doubt and a sort of moral nausea. What is all that for? he asked himself, but found no answer. Chapter 55 On the following day, Nekludov drove to the lawyer and told him of the Menshoff's case, asking him to take up their defence. The lawyer listened to him attentively and said that if the facts were really as told to Nekludov, he would undertake their defence without compensation. Nekludov also told him of the 130 men kept in prison through some misunderstanding and asked him whose fault he thought it was. The lawyer was silent for a short while, evidently desiring to give an accurate answer. Whose fault it is? No one's, he said decisively. If you ask the prosecutor, he will tell you that it is Maslenikov's fault, and if you ask Maslenikov, he will tell you that it is the prosecutor's fault. It is no one's fault. I will go to Maslenikov and tell him. That is useless, the lawyer retorted, smiling. He is. He is not your friend or relative, is he? He is such a blockhead, and saving your presence, at the same time, such a sly beast. Nekludov recalled what Maslenikov had said about the lawyer, made no answer, and taking leave, directed his steps toward Maslenikov's residence. Two things Nekludov wanted of Maslenikov. First, to obtain Maslova's transfer to the hospital, and to help, if possible, the 130 unfortunates. Although it was hard for him to be dealing with this man, and especially to ask favours of him, yet it was the only way of gaining his end, and he had to go through it. As Nekludov approached Maslenikov's house, he saw a number of carriages, cabs and traps standing in front of it, and he recalled that this was the reception day to which he had been invited. While Nekludov was approaching the house, a carriage was standing near the curb, opposite the door, and a lackey in a cockaded silk hat and cape was seating a lady, who, raising the long train of her skirt, displayed the sharp joints of her toes through the thin slippers. Among the carriages he recognised the covered landau of the Korchigins. The grey-haired, rosy-cheeked driver deferentially raised his hat. Nekludov had scarcely asked the porter where Michael Ivanovich, Maslenikov, was, when the latter appeared on the carpeted stairway, escorting a very important guest, such as he usually escorted not to the upper landing, but to the vestibule. This very important military guest, while descending the stairs, was conversing in French about a lottery for the benefit of orphan asylums, giving his opinion that it was a good occupation for ladies. They enjoy themselves while they are raising money. Qu'elles s'amusent et que le bon Dieu les bénisse. 
Ah, Nekludov, how do you do? You haven't shown yourself for a long time, he greeted Nekludov. Allez présenter vos devoirs à madame. The Korshagin are here too. Toutes les jolies femmes de la ville, he said, holding out and somewhat raising his military shoulders for his overcoat, which was being placed on him by his own magnificent lackey in gold-braided uniform. Au revoir, mon cher. Then he shook Maslenikov's hand. Well, now let us go upstairs. How glad I am, Maslenikov began excitedly, seizing Nekludov by the arm, and notwithstanding his corpulence, nimbly leading him up the stairs. Maslenikov was in a particularly happy mood, which Nekludov could not help ascribing to the attention shown him by the important person. Every attention shown him by an important person put him into such an ecstasy as may be observed in a fawning little dog when its master pats it, strokes it, and scratches under its ears. It wags its tail, shrinks, wriggles, and, straightening its ears, madly runs in a circle. Maslenikov was ready to do the same thing. He did not notice the grave expression on Nekludov's face, nor hear what he was saying, but irresistibly dragged him into the reception room. Nekludov involuntarily followed. Business afterward. I will do anything you wish, said Maslenikov, leading him through the parlour. Announce Prince Nekludov to Her Excellency, he said on the way to a lackey. The lackey, in an ambling gait, ran ahead of them. Bunavik ordonné, but you must see my wife without fail. She would not forgive my failure to present you last time you were here. Eh? The lackey had already announced him when they entered, and Anna Ignatievna, the vice-governess, Mrs. General, as she called herself, sat on a couch surrounded by ladies. As Nekludov approached, she was already leaning forward with a radiant smile on her face. At the other end of the reception room, women sat around a table, while men in military uniforms and civil attire stood over them. An incessant cackle came from that direction. And Finn, why do you estrange yourself? Have we offended you in any way? With these words, presupposing an intimacy between her and Nekludov, which never existed, Anna Ignatievna greeted him. Are you acquainted? Madame Belyavskaya, Michael Ivanovich Chernov, take a seat here. Missy, venez donc à notre table, on vous apportera votre dé. And you, she turned to the officer who was conversing with Missy, evidently forgetting his name. Come here, please. Will you have some tea, prince? No, no. I will never agree with you. She simply did not love him, said a woman's voice. But she loved Pie. Eternally, those stupid jests, laughingly interfered another lady in a high hat and dazzling with gold and diamonds. Set excellent, these waffles, and so light. Let us have some more. Well, how soon are you going to leave us? Yes, this is the last day. That is why we came here. Such a beautiful spring! How pleasant it is in the country! Missy in her hat, and some dark, striped dress which clasped her waist without a wrinkle, was very pretty. She blushed when she saw Nekludov. I thought you had left the city, she said to him. Almost. Business keeps me here. I come here also for business. Call on Mama. She is very anxious to see you, she said and feeling that she was lying, and that he understood it, her face turned a still deeper purple. I shall hardly have the time, gloomily answered Nekludov, pretending not to see that she was blushing. Missy frowned angrily, shrugged her shoulders, and turned to an elegant officer, who took from her hands the empty teacup and valiantly carried it to another table, his sword striking every object it encountered. You must also contribute toward the asylum. I am not refusing, only I wish to keep my contribution for the lottery. There I will show all my liberality. Don't forget now, a plainly dissimulating laugh was heard. The reception day was brilliant, and Anna Ignatievna was delighted. Mika told me that you busy yourself in the prisons. I understand it very well, she said to Nekludov. Mika? She meant her stout husband, Maslenikov, may have his faults, but you know that he is kind. All these unfortunate prisoners are his children. He does not look on them in any other light. Il est d'une bonté. She stopped, 
not finding words to express bonté of a husband, and immediately, smiling, turned to an old, wrinkled woman in lilac-coloured bows who had just entered. Having talked as much and as meaninglessly as it was necessary to preserve the decorum, Nekhludoff arose and went over to Maslenikov. Will you please hear me now? Ah, yes, well, what is it? Come in here. They entered a small Japanese cabinet and seated themselves near the window. 